CFL on CTV is brought to you by Canadian Pacific, owned by Canadians, working for Canadians. Stadium in Edmonton. It's the Western Conference Final. Featuring the Calgary Stampeders versus the Edmonton Eskimos. And as you have undoubtedly noted, a bright but very cool day, minus 21 degrees, but there is one good note, and that is the fact that there is very little wind. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Stevenson, welcoming you once again to the CFL on CTV for a very important game. And with me, Al McCann of our Western CTV crew, who is going to be roaming the sidelines by the Edmonton bench while I travel around the Calgary bench. And Al, you have seen a lot of great games that the Eskimos have participated in over the years. But I'm wondering if you've ever seen one that has had more enthusiasm from the fans than this one. Well, I haven't, you know, but if you think about it, it's a natural. The first ever calgary Edmonton matchup in a Western final. And these two teams have a history of rivalry that goes back so long I don't care what the weather's like, you'd have a sellout crowd. I think they could have sold 75,000 tickets. A lot of Calgarians weren't able to get tickets. They have to sit in the warmth and watch our telecast. You know, I'll tell you, it's going to be a great one. You know what I'm noticing just now? The noise you hear at the Olympic Stadium in Montreal, as you know, is deafening. I'll tell you, it is just as noisy here right now. These fans are definitely ready. They are ready. But getting to the game, we've got two opposite teams, two opposite coaches. Edmonton have to suddenly find themselves in combat. The Calgary Stampeders obviously had the momentum. And oh. I think the key is, can the Eskimos get themselves up to their prime? That's the question. Yeah, if they can, wonderful. All right, Al McCann, we'll see what happens during the game. We'll be back uh, as the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. Brian Monahan to the press box, please. Brian Monahan, press box. Hello, everybody. I'm Pat Marsden. With me, Mike Wadsworth and Frank Rigney, and there aren't three more excited guys in this park than us because we think this is going to be a dynamite football game. Riggs, the Stampeders are the slight underdogs. What do they have to do to win? Well, Pat, I think they deserve the underdog role, of course, because the Edmonton Eskimos walked away with the Western Conference. They settled it, of course, a month ago. But as far as what they have to do, I think they've got an excellent defensive ball club. Both teams do. The front four of the uh, Calgary Stampeders has probably be underrated so far. I don't think they'll have to blitz that much to get to Tom Wilkinson, but Wilkie releases the ball so quick, they're going to have a problem. But number one, they've got to get a pass rush. Number two, they've got to get a good run running game going for them. And they, hope, of course, have an excellent chance to do that with Sykes and Burden in the backfield. Burden, in my mind, has just had an outstanding season in terms of blocking for Jim Sykes. He made Jim Sykes what he did this year, and Sykes, of course, was over 1,000 yards. Well, you know, it's funny. We hear all the enthusiasm supposedly leaning toward Calgary because they've been so hot of late, winning nine and ten and six in a row. But I have a sneaking suspicion that the Eskimos are every bit as high for this game. Pat, I don't think there's any doubt of it. Uh, they were number one, as Frank has said, and settled that early. They want to come back now and get a shot at the Grey Cup again. I think they uh, want to vindicate themselves from their performance last year. But I think in looking at the two teams, if there is a, a difference in strength, it may be in the linebacking core. Calgary certainly strong with Ali Bakken, but the Eskimos with Dan Kepley, I think he's just tremendous. The big difference, I think, between the two, the, the speed and range that Dan Kepley has. When you're working against the running backs, Willie Burton and Jim Sykes, you need that kind of range. He has it. 
I think also the Stampeders may be a little weak in the outside linebacking positions. That's where Wilkinson may attack. Well, let's go down to field level right now for the playing of our national anthem. This is the CFL on CTV. We'll return for the opening kickoff in just a moment. Well, we'll tell you one more time that it's cold. It's eight degrees below zero Fahrenheit, but so what? The enthusiasm of these two clubs will heat it up because they are set to go, and it's Kelvin Kirk, 14, along with Sykes, number 11, as Sykes takes it five yards in his end zone. Sykes gets out close to the 20-yard line, and that's where the Calgary Stampeders will put it into play after that 70-yard kickoff by Dave Cutler and a 25-yard return by James Sykes. All right, let's tell you about this Calgary offense. It will be John Huffnagel at quarterback. Coming into this game, having completed 53% of his passes, Willie Burton is there along with James Sykes as the running backs. You look at the Stampeder receivers right now. They can catch the football, but we anticipate they'll run it a lot this afternoon. Slipped a little bit going back, did Huffnagel. And now he floats it up there for Forzani, and it was very nearly intercepted by Joe Holloman. Pat, I think one thing we are going to see throughout the afternoon is the Calgary Stampeders throwing the football a lot more on first down. They have been so successful, as you mentioned, running the ball throughout the year. Jack got us, so they have to throw it on first down from time to time. I think they'll have a lot of time to throw that football, but just didn't throw it very well. Almost a big turnover on the first play, Mike. And you know, the field conditions are tough in the sense that the, the turf is just frozen. Tom Fortani lost his footing a little bit, trying to break over the sideline. All right, so it's second and 10 for the Stampeders, just inside their 20. Huffnagel does not get the first down as he's dropped up around the 26-yard line. And that will mean that Cyril McFall and the Calgary punting unit will come out onto the field. Like you can certainly see here as Huffnagel takes off, just what kind of footing these ball players are going to have. Looks like he's skating on very thin ice right about here. Kind of tough on those offensive linemen too, Frank, trying to set up on those kind of frozen conditions. Absolutely. Any sort of passive move, I think they've got an advantage on drop-back protection, etc. But on running plays where they have to try and take off, it's going to be tough. 
Huey Campbell not taking any chances, has three men deep as McFall gets the punt away to high on his own 45. Larry Highbar gets it into the Calgary 45-yard line, and the Eskimos, the first time they get the ball, get their hands on it inside Calgary territory. A 38-yard punt by McFall and a 20-yard return by Larry Highbar. It appeared for a while as if he was just picking his way through, but he did a great job, got some good blocking, too, to open up that initial alley. So they start from the Calgary 45 with Tom Wilkinson, number 12, at quarterback. Jim Germany with 885 yards rushing and Don Warrington, number 21, as their two running backs. Wilkinson puts it up. The catch is made by McGowan, and he steps out at about the 39. He'll have six yards. Mike, that's the kind of passing offense I think we can anticipate from the Eskimos. Hitting those receivers very quickly. The outside receivers, of course, McGowan on that occasion, but also going to those inside receivers uh, quite a bit. Tommy Scott in particular. I think there's a couple of reasons, Frank, why they would want to do that, too. The field conditions, first of all, it's going to be tough to get those long patterns where you're going to have to make a number of cuts. Also, you're concerned about that Calgary rush. It is second and four Eskimos at the Calgary 39. Give us the Germany has the and drives his way in close to the 27 yard line. I don't know what this move was, uh, Mike. Maybe you can analyze it for me, but John Helton simply goes out of the play and creates a hole himself for the running back. As he just moves to the outside. The cross block between Bill Stevenson and the right tackle Willie Martin, but Helton just took himself out of the play. I didn't see McElhaney coming down. Sometimes you have your end and tackle stunts. Whether or not there's a mix up or John Helton was just gambling, we don't know. And his first down, Eskimos, and looking for Waddell Smith in the end zone. No good. That close to putting the first points on the board. Very well thrown pass. Tom Wilkinson to Waddell Smith. I thought a great move by Waddell Smith, too, to just split the coverage of Al Burleson and Terry Irvin. It appeared at first as if they had him covered like a blanket, but he did a great job to come in and almost pick it up. You saw Stu Lang running into some pretty heavy traffic there, and you know that this will be a physical game throughout. And let me just congratulate Queen's University. They knocked off the University of British Columbia 16-3 this afternoon to win the college ball. Second and ten. Eskimos at the Calgary 27. There's Smith again, and he overthrew him this time. Wilkinson had him in the open. But and he's got an ball. awful lot of time to throw the football, Pat. If they give him that much time, he's going to make some success sooner or later. Watch the job that Bill Stevenson and Willie Turner do on Big John Helton, the number one pass rusher, of course, for the Stampeders. Helton is absolutely stopped right at the line of scrimmage. There's no penetration by any of the front four of the Calgary Stampeders. Of course, they rely on the rush that Helton provides to them because he's been the big man in their front four, Frank. He has, along with Reggie Lewis, number 60 to right defensive end. Not very big, but an excellent pass rusher. Cutler's field goal drive will come from just inside the 35. There is nobody in the end zone. They'll give him a point if he misses the three. It is good. The Eskimos hit the scoreboard. They go out in front, three to nothing. And we are just underway here at the beautiful Commonwealth Stadium in northern Alberta. Three nothing Edmonton. The CFL on CTV continues in a moment. fans are right on the money because it's a 3-0 ball game in favor of the Eskimos as you see the Stampede defense trying to keep warm on the sidelines. But now, 
The story is John Hufnagel and the offense from their own 35. And let's see what they can do. Huffnagel is forced out at about the 43-yard line. Dale Potter was over there with him, and Huffnagel apparently felt that he'd been hit out of bounds. I'm not sure that he certainly wasn't touched anyway. Well, both quarterbacks have certainly had a lot of time to throw the football so far. Huffnagel's had to take off on two separate occasions. He picked up about eight yards the first time and just about a comparable amount that time, but the defensive backs obviously doing an excellent job so far. There's your Edmonton Eskimo front four, the Alberta crude. With Boone and Este at the defensive ends and Fennell and Henschel on the inside. Fennell, the man they call Dr. Depp, as you look at the Eskimo linebackers, and they are three very talented individuals, led by the great Dan Kepley, 42. Now, this is Burton. Burton looks for the first down, and he's got it. The Stampeders get their first, first down of the ball game and cross the 45 to about the 46-yard line. Excellent block by Tom Humphreys, number 51, on Ron Este, the right defensive end, 55. He just pulls Este down to the inside, creating enough room for Burton to pick up the initial first down for the Stampeders. Pretty good block on Butler, too, and he tried to come up and support. Stampeders will burden the S with Calgary's Grey Cup magic in 1978? Well, we're going to find out within the next couple of hours because this one is expected to go right to the wire. Upnagel delivers. It is complete to Forzani across midfield for the first down at about the Edmonton 53, a gain of 11. There doesn't seem to be too much doubt. It's going to be an afternoon of the passing game. A defensive front four of both sides, not really able to get any penetration. I think the field conditions taking its toll there as well. They're just not getting the traction. John Huffnagel dropping back to pass has all the time. And of course, Tommy Forzani is as sure-handed a receiver as you'll find anywhere. The Stampeders are on the move. Back-to-back -back first downs. Now have it at the Eskimo 53. The draw goes to Sykes. And Sykes crosses the 50 into about the 49-yard line. Tom Collins, number 20, was there to make it stop. I'll tell you, Mike, I'm confused once again with what's happening defensively in that front four. Watch Dave Finnell. He jumps over to the offensive center very tightly right before the ball is snapped, and he creates the hole. Almost this, this comparable move that John Helton made before. Tidley hardly had to block Finnell at all. They had two of their linebackers in tight, though, Frank. You may have noticed, and I think they were trying to create an overshifted back on the snap of the ball. It is second and six, Calgary, from the Edmonton 49. Huffnagel is dropped back at about the 54-yard line. Potter was first in. They have strength in their outside linebackers as well. We mentioned that earlier. And Dale Potter, when Huffnagel rolled to his side, coming on the force, Boone as well into helping the stop. But it was Dale Potter who came up with the big play. Tommy Persani was the man that Huffnagel was looking for to that side. Holloman in coverage, but... There's a pretty good idea as to what the field conditions are. He just couldn't get open. Huffnagel never had a shot. There's no way they're going to be able to make cuts that quickly. Right? High ball lets it roll. Picks it up at about the 23. Flags do not come down. And High ball gets out over the 25 to about the 28. So now the job will rest with the Calgary defense to contain the Eskimos. It's a 3-0 ball game in favor of Edmonton, and the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. The Eskimos have the football at their 28-yard line. It is Bob Howes, 53 at center. Up in 57, Stevenson, 62, are the guards. Willie Martin, 50, and Charlie Turner, 60, are the tackles. Tom Wilkinson is a quarterback. And again, had an outstanding season. This is Jim Germany. Germany gets back to the line of scrimmage and not much further. Rob Koschel moving quickly to help on the tackle as Germany ran into Reggie Lewis, number 60. You mentioned Reggie Lewis earlier, Frank. He showed pretty good quickness coming from the backside. That's his real strength, Mike. He, he's not really that big, and you can see uh, an interesting stat up on your set now. This is the first time we've ever had an All-Alberta final. The game by Germany is about a yard, so make it second and nine. Eskimos just inside their 30-yard line.
Hawkinson going deep. This is McGowan, and he begins the struggle for the ball and then drops it. Terry Irvin had a shot at the ball. Now let's see who got it back. McGowan simply stole the football out of the hands of Terry Irvin and then lost the ball as he was heading for the end zone. You'll never see a greater effort by a pass receiver than George McGowan here. Terry Irvin had good coverage, but what a job he did jumping high and just out fighting him for the ball. It looks as if he's going for six points, and he was thinking too much about the six and looking to see who was there. You saw how he just dropped the ball. That'll happen with this kind of weather. A very tough break for the Eskimos, Frank, after a superb effort. I don't think you're going to see fumbles of this kind very often after that great effort, as you mentioned, going up and just taking the ball away from Irving. McGowan fumbles in the open field. I think it's ultimately Terry Irving that finally makes a recovery for the snap Peters, the first turnover of this football game. We will wait and see, but that could be the play of the year right there. This is Willie Burton, and he gets nowhere. Well, that Eskimo defense isn't going to get upset. They were all over Willie B. He just didn't get a chance to get away. Tommy Towns, what a linebacker he's developed into. It's amazing, Pat. They didn't have Dave Fennell in there on first down. It must have been an equipment problem or something. Bill Stevenson was in at that defensive tackle spot, but Fennell has returned to his right, rightful spot at that right tackle. Thank you, Frank. It is second and 10 for the Stampeders from their 35. Upnagel got some pressure early, now delivers, and the reception is made for the first down with the completion going to Willie Armstead. Gain was 28 yards, Huffnagel to Armstead. Ron Estee took that inside rush, Frank, that could be critical. Tommy Humphrey did a great job sealing him in. Huffnagel rolled outside of it and had all the time he needed. Well, Huffnagel's not a great runner, as, as we know, but you've seen him take off a couple of times and pick up seven or eight yards, but he is a good enough runner to, to get away from that rush, which he did there. All right, five minutes, 50 seconds left to play in this opening quarter, a 3-0 ball game in favor of the Eskimos, but the Stampeders are on the move at the Edmonton 52. Huffnagel throws again for Armstead, and this time it is knocked away by Greg Butler, number 28. It looked like the ball wasn't thrown quickly enough. Butler almost picks his football off. A little bit of pressure by Tom Towns on Huffnagel. Al McCann is down at uh, the frozen turf. Let's hear from Al. Well, Frank, the reason uh, Dave Fennell missed the play is changing shoes. A lot of guys are opting to the broom ball shoe now, so you see a real variance of shoe wear out on the field right now. Thank you, Al. It is second and ten. Stan Peters at the Eskimo 52-53 yard line. Huffnagel slipped. Now he puts it up, and Rosanna was not able to make the catch looking back over his shoulder. And I'm just wondering, is he looking into the sun? He, he is, Pat, and I think that was his problem because that ball was right to his, uh, to his chest. It was a rather difficult position he found himself in to make the reception, but the ball was delivered right to him. He seemed push off from Joe Holloman just a bit, but he's looking right back to the southwest I believe it is where the sun is coming out I don't know the direction Frank but you and I were down there before the game and it is strong you look up into that one corner pad and it's just blinding you got to know that Jack Goda was saying what do we have to do to get a big gainer the ball was right there Tommy you should have had it Cyril McFall with a driving butt that high bar has to go back to a six yard line to take Vickers slowed him down enough so that Highbow was not able to break it for the distance, but he does return the 44-yard punt, 29 yards. Well, specialty teams, of course, playing such an important role in any championship football team, and Larry Highbow has probably been the most dominant factor in this game to this point with four minutes and 35 seconds left to play in this opening quarter. It was his punt return earlier that gave the Eskimos field position in at the Calgary 45 and set up their ultimate field goal. Germany, and that fired up Calgary front four there to just snow him under after he gains maybe a couple. Hey, that Calgary defense, very stubborn against the run. Tom Wilkinson wants to keep them honest and threaten with Germany, but hasn't had great success apart from that one play earlier in the first quarter. 
Actually, he was fortunate to just get back to the original line of scrimmage, so let's spot the ball at the 37 and make it second and 10 for the Eskimos from that point. Wilkinson looking for Waddell Smith, and again, it's over his head. Smith was there, but unfortunately, from Edmonton's viewpoint, Wilkie simply overthrew him a little bit, although I did think that Smith stopped his route. He had three people on that same side. Fryer, Scott, and Smith were all working on that right offensive side, trying to get to the sideline with Smith, but whether or not it was a matter of the pattern being changed or Wilkinson overthrowing, we can't say, but certainly there wasn't much chance of success there. First punt of the ball game for Hank Alisic, the leader in the CFL, and he gets a beauty away that Kirk chases down at his 25. Oh, good return. He was level as he crossed the 45 to about the 49, and just as well when he was hit because he was gone. Hector Poitier, I believe it was, Pat number 63, who really drilled Kirk. You'll well, see we the hit right here. Still an outstanding 24-yard punt return by Kelvin Kirk. It gives the Stampeders a first down very close to their 48-yard line with three minutes. 15 seconds left to play in this opening quarter. The Eskimos are out in front, 3-0. Deep for Kirk, and he's all alone. And he's forced out on the saving tackle by Pete Lavarado at about the nine-yard line. There was nobody around. Kelvin Kirk. Edmonton three, Calgary nothing, and the CFL on CTV continues in moments. A big 54-yard play to Kelvin Kirk. It appeared that either Greg Butler or Larry Highbaugh just had a mix-up in their coverage because he was wide open on the play, and it was only the shooting play by Lavarado that got him out of bounds. I think Paul Hybel actually fell on the play, Mike, as he was trying to provide some coverage on Kirk. Ball is at the eight-yard line of the Eskimos. Stampede is trailing three to nothing and threatening to take the lead right now as Hotnagel puts it up. No good. Looking for Forzani about 20 yards deep in the end zone, but there was excellent coverage by that Eskimo secondary. Greg Butler was all over him. He just won't see better coverage than that. And covering an outstanding receiver. You know, gentlemen, I'll tell you what's impressed me. There had been the suggestion that the Eskimos scored early, that the Stampeders, because of their inexperience, might get a little bit shaken up and crumble. Boy, I'll tell you, they're showing a lot of points right now with a second down at the eight-yard line of the Eskimos. by Towns back at the 18-yard line. Big play for the Eskimo defense. I'll tell you, that was just a great job by Towns because Jim Sykes, the back on that side, number 11, steps up and tries to take the shooting linebacker, number 20, Tom Towns, and Towns just runs over Sykes. Take a look at it. See the shot that Sykes takes from Towns right there, and he just goes right through him for the quarterback sack. Well, First he one is, of this ball game. He is a tough little guy, that Towns. That's a pretty good shot from ground level of Towns handling Sykes. I noticed, too, that the Eskimos are sometimes flipping Estee and Hinchel, putting Hinchel to the outside and moving Estee over to the defensive left. Let's see if McFall can tie it from 25 yards, and he does. We are all tied up at three with a minute and 52 seconds left to play in the opening quarter. The game has gone, according to most of the experts who said it'll be close right till the end. Well, I was just talking to the Calgary Stampeders players, John Helton, as a matter of fact, and Sykes, and they state that the one problem they have out there, same as the Eskimos, and that is the footwear. 
It's very slippery on the field. But as far as handling the ball is concerned, Huffnagel says he has no problem handling it or throwing the ball. The problem is setting up because he said the slickness of the field is making it difficult for everybody. Okay, Pat? Thank you, Bill. And if you joined us late, let me pass along the temperature. It is 18 degrees minus. Minus. Right. Right. Celsius. I'm always confused with that one. I know it's about minus eight on the old one anyway. But in looking at the field before the ball game, I think if there is an advantage as far as the field conditions are concerned, at the end that Calgary just got their field goal on, that when they put the heat underneath the tarp to cover this field earlier, it was blowing from that north end, and it's the left side of the field as we're viewing it is much more uh, favorable to footing where you see the receivers for the Edmonton Eskimos. That falls kickoff is taken on the fly by Butler. Let's make that Holloman 29 and not 28. And his return gets the Eskimos good field position out at their 48-yard line. And the countdown to the Grey Cup is starting right now. All the excitement will come your way here on CTV. And just a reminder that tomorrow, the Canadian Junior Football Final features the Ottawa Sooners and the Saskatoon Hilltops in Saskatoon. Boy, if you're in that area, why not go out and support those guys because they play just dynamite football. First down, Eskimos at their 48-yard line. Smith gets close to midfield. Good job by the Calgary defense because they were there to contain him to a gain of about six or seven. Interesting move by Bill Stevenson, the right offensive guard, number 62. He pulls to the left, trying to lead the defense that the play is going that way, and then he turns around to try and provide extra blocking help. However, Waddell Smith, with his great speed, gets in front of Stevenson, number 62, and he can't really help him very much from there. Well, the game was about six yards, make it second and four. As you get a good close look at Tom Wilkinson. Two out of five so far. Throws and it's knocked down just as George McGowan thought he was going to get his hands on it. Rob Koschel was there with the big defensive play for the Stampeders. Pat, Mike, can you believe we got just 33 seconds remaining in this first quarter? We have not seen a red flag go down in the field yet. We have not had a penalty. Well, I'll tell you, it's not because they aren't physical, because it has been. I think maybe the officials want to get this over as quick as possible and get on home. Alisic now stands at his 40. Kirk and Forzani are inside their 15. Powering punt, driving one that Kirk is back to his four-yard line again. He slipped a little bit, still managed to get to the 10, and now we get our first flag. <laughs> Six yards, five, six, six, six. The, the first penalty of the game is a clipping call. As you look at Jack Goda, a little bit concerned, obviously, because his club is deep in its own territory right now. What a job he's done, though. Two years as the general manager and coach of the Stampeders, took them from the basement to the Western Conference Final, and it's all tied right now at three with 20 seconds left to play in this opening quarter. The ball is just inside the Calgary five-yard line. Tough spot to be in, particularly with these field conditions. Well, that's probably why we haven't had too many flags in this ball game. When you look at that stat, the Eskimos were the least penalized team in the entire CFL. second one now of course that was inevitable well, I had to bring it up <laughs> it's like being in the cover of Sports Illustrated <laughs> well that's a tribute too to the coaching staffs of both these clubs the fact that we had not had a penalty because obviously they're both very well disciplined units. it's a legal procedure Calgary number 57 well, you heard the call Harold Holton the right offensive guard jumping offside there called a procedure penalty Steve Kurtzinger, number 69, was guilty of the clipping infraction on the punt return. So Calgary's really dug themselves a hole. This should be the last play in the first quarter, or in a penalty play. Ball is at about the two and a half yard line, first down. Give us inside the burden, and he gets back maybe to the five yard line. 
As the gun sounds to end the first quarter of play, the score, Calgary 3, Edmonton 3. This is the CFL on CTV. We'll have second quarter action in a moment. Next week, it's the Grey Cup game, and the outstanding offensive and defensive players will both receive a 1979 Grand Prix compliments of Labatt's. That's next week. Right now, it is second and ten for the Stampeders at their own five. And Huffdagel is going deep for Armstead. He does not make the catch. I don't know if the high his hand on it. I don't really know, Pat, but I think the high ball, at least momentarily, misjudged that football. He seemed to stop, and the ball almost got over the top of him to uh, uh, Armstead. I think he did get a piece of it right there with his left hand. Good play by high ball. I think you're right. Prematurely. There it is. Just got a hand on it. Paul has certainly been picking the ball very, very low, Pat. I mean, he's gotten reasonable yardage, but they've been returning the ball excellently against uh, McFall's punt. That's a pretty good putt away this time again. And this time, it bounces beyond Holloman's reach, and he's back now to his 47-yard line. Blaine Lamoureux, I think, making his stop. As you look at the stats of the first quarter, the Everton Eskimos picking up only one first down. And you see the total yards favoring the Stampeders, 98 to 70. That was a 43-yard punt by McFall and minus 15 on the return. So he gets them out of a jam as the Stampeders had scrimmaged the ball from their five-yard line, and now Edmonton takes over at their own 47. This one is picked up. Down of the ball game. 52 yards, the interception returned for a touchdown, and the Stampeders are out in front. Waddell Smith was the intended receiver just breaking to the sideline. Wilkinson was looking for him, but Ray Odoms was ready. His tremendous quickness read the play extremely well and took it in. Al Wilson was suggesting to us earlier, Frank, that possibly big breaks could carry the day for Calgary Stampeders that they had some defenders who could make those big breaks. In fact, he singled out Ray Odoms. It appears to me that Al may be a bit of a prophet in this game. Well, of course, Mike, uh, Al is right here with the booth with us. And uh, Al, you look like a, a great forecaster at this point in time. You actually did, as Mike said, pick Ray Odoms to maybe break this ball game up early on. I can't believe that I did it, but it made me feel good like that. Well, I guess, I guess that proves that the offensive linemen really know what's going on, Mike. In any event, generally know what's going on. Well, it's a, a very interesting football game so far. How do you uh, view the field conditions as an advantage to either ball club, or is there an advantage? Uh, no, the defenses are going to dictate, and field position is going to control the whole game. I think Calgary, what they need, because I think Edmonton is a superior team, is a break just like that. One more major break, and Calgary can win this football game. Well, you said uh, before the ball game started that Calgary needed two big breaks to win this ball game. They've gotten one already. Yep, they got one half to pick off another. Okay, Al, thanks for being with us. Al Wilson, the great offensive center of the British Columbia Lions and a Shenley finalist for Offensive Lineman of the Year. As you see, Ray Odoms had three interceptions during the regular campaign, none bigger than that one. As he takes it all the way for the touchdown, the point after was good, and the Stampeders are out in front 10-3. This is Holloman. Good return by Joe Holloman. The ball comes loose, but I believe it was whistled dead at the 42-yard line. 55 yards to kick off, 32 yards, yards to return by Joe Holloman. Now, let's take a look, gentlemen, at this very experienced Edmonton club and see how they react to that little bit of adversity. Mike, that stat that we had up in the first quarter statistics for each ball club was very interesting. As I pointed out, the Eskimos had only one first down, as we call, early in this ball game. That first down came after McGowan made a reception and fumbled the football away. Rookie really hasn't no been, kind of drive yet. Rookie hasn't been really sharp. A couple of times he's had receivers open and just hasn't been able to get them there. Give us to Germany. 
And he drives his way to the 45, so he'll have a gain of about three. Tough sledding inside when you're going against Reggie Lewis, Andy Jonas, and John Helton and Ed McElhenney. That's the front four for the Stampeders as you see the number of turnovers. Two by the Eskimos. And the score, indicative of that, 10 to 3 in favor of the Stampeders. We've got 12 minutes, 55 seconds left to play in this first half. And Wilkinson has dropped back at the 37-yard line. I'll tell you, we've talked about John Helton and Reggie Lewis on the pass rush, but McElhenney has been no slouch either. He's number 64. They have three people out of those four that are excellent pass rushers. McElhenney is the one this time that gets the pressure on Wilkie and gets to the sack. He's, of course, working against Willie Turner, number 60, the right offensive tackle. And you can see him pretty pleased with himself with that one. Here's another look at it. Of course, Frank, as you know, when you have a couple of good men like that, like uh, Lewis and Helton, you can't double-team everybody. McElhinney's going to get a little bit more of a shot to get in. That ball was touched by the Stampeders. A flag comes down, though, because no yards will be ruled. It was not a good punt by Hank Elisic. The Stampeder player very alertly touched it with many people in that five-yard restraining zone. It was only a 28-yard punt. But the Stampeders will retain possession. You can see the crowd of people that's there. It's certainly not just a matter of Elisic being around it. There's a whole host of Eskimos that would have been within that five-yard zone. Well, the fans don't like it here at Commonwealth Stadium, but I think it's an excellent call, gentlemen. Couldn't agree with you more. If there's any question about it, Pat, it was a very alert play by the Calgary Stampeders. No yards against Edwin. As I give yards, and the ball is touched. Referee is Don Barker for this very important Western Conference final. They only threw two penalties in that first quarter, and they came with fewer than 30 seconds left to play. So the Stampeders now, with the penalty, take over at the Edmonton 48-yard line. got to the line of scrimmage and no further. All right, I've got Ray Autumns, the man who made the big play and the big First break the in this game. Ray, how did it come about? Well, I was just playing back and he was running out and he looked over my way and he threw the ball and I happened to have a good break on the ball and I got it and it worked out real good for me. It certainly did. Ray, is that sun bothering you? No, not at all. Not at all. Eh? How about the footing? The cold is pretty. The footing, every, you know, you hit an ice spot every now and then, but Really, it's all right, except you hit the bad spot. It's cold, though. That's all. Okay, thanks, Ray Odom. Now, Pat. This is Sykes, written out of bounds by Pete Lavarado at the 42, and the Stampeders will be well short of the first down. Good job by Lloyd Fairbanks, the right offensive tackle, number 66. You see him coming out trying to open the outside, and he knocks down linebacker Potter, number 30. Well short of a first down and you know Mike uh, besides the two big turnovers that the Calgary Stampeders have gotten from the Eskimos they got a real break too when Cyril McCall had to punt out of his own end zone and Holloman lost 15 yards on the return after fumbling the football. No question but you know what's impressed me about the Stampeders the strength of their defensive unit. I think they've done a great job at this point. McCall puts it high Holloman is at his six yard line slips down. And then with good second effort gets out to the 15 yard line but it looked like he wasn't going to gain an inch. It was a 37 yard punt by McFall and a 10 yard return by Joe Holloman who is a little slow getting to his feet. Well you talk about the Eskimos and they are a veteran club. They've been in the Western Conference final for the last six straight years. They of course were in the Grey Cup game last year losing it to Montreal and now they find themselves in trouble at their 15 yard line trailing 10 to 3 with 10 minutes and 45 seconds left to play in this first half. The blitz was on and Germany got back to the line of scrimmage and not much further. 
Sal Burleson on a safety blitz there, and he just happens to hit the hole at the, exactly the right spot. If we start it up right now, you'll see number 27 coming into your screen on the left side. Stop it right there. There's Burleson making the move from his safety spot. Kind of a gambling type of defense, and you won't see the Stampeders blitz that often, Mike, except at either end of the field, if they're trying to pin the Eskimos in or if they're in real trouble at the other end of the field. That is second and nine, Eskimos. 15 and a half yard line. Wilkinson for McGowan. He's got the big first down. Out over the 45 to the 48 yard line. And Odoms was there to make the tackle. The Stampeders lead it 10 to 3. And the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. Big play to George McGowan, 33 yards to get them from out of their own end and keep this drive alive. Working against Ray Odom. Odom somehow just seemed to give way. He thought that McGowan was working into the deep middle. Obviously, he was playing the zone, and he had held up in his coverage. He saw McGowan just break free. Well, the Eskimos have completed three passes. All three receptions made by George McGowan. First down, Edmonton at their 48. German, good hole. Out over midfield, into the Calgary 54-yard line. Well, Odoms was certainly the victim of uh, George McGowan on that last 33-yard reception, but the key to this ball game so far has been that same Ray Odoms on this pickoff. The only major score of this ball game is Odoms picks one off intended for Waddell Smith and scores the six-pointer for Calgary. That's been the story of the first half as they've traded field goals in the first quarter. It's still a 10-3 ball game favoring the Stampeders. Certainly hasn't unsettled the Eskimos. Tom Wilkinson coming back, quite content to work away at it as Jim Sykes takes a look at the sideline, trying to stay warm. And his second and two Eskimos at the Calgary 54. The Eskimos have won the Western Championship five of the last six years. The pass is complete to Warrington. He's got the first down and tripped up by... John Palazzetti at about the 45 yard line. I tell you, this is the kind of passing game you see Warrington going down on the play, but Warrington lined up in a slot back position. You'll see him just hold up there for a counter to and slip across the formation. The rush almost gets to Tom Wilkinson, but Warrington is wide open. Only a saving tackle by John Palazzetti negated a very large gain for Don Warrington. Hey, was big, big John Helton was in on the rush and just about had the sack. Still being. Uh, Intended now. That was one of his first catches, you can see. But that hard drill that Warrington went down on looked like he hurt his right knee. And with Warrington leaving the ball game, Angelo Santucci, the ex Hamilton Tie Cat, is in for the Eskimos. You know, Pat, they'll take Warrington out of the ball game the odd time on passing situations and insert the young Brian Fryer in there as an additional uh, deep threat. We haven't seen uh, Wilkie go to him, of course, yet this afternoon. First down, Edmonton, Calgary, 45 and a half. Dra is the Germany, and he's upended by Big John Helton as he gets to about the 41-yard line. The game will be close to five. Make it second and a long five for the Eskimos as they spot the ball now at the 41, so that's what it is, second and five. With seven minutes and 50 seconds left to play in this first half, the Stampeders are out in front, 10 to three. Cold, yes, but everybody in the ball game now. Weather not a factor. What is is the scoreboard? Wilkinson throws. No flags come down. The fans once again are upset. But I thought it was good defense. Well done. Mike, you were talking about defensive ends taking the inside route, and McElhenney did at that time. But we have a 10 to 3 ball game and a timeout, so the CFL on CTV will continue in just a moment. 
Personally, I thought it was great defense, too, Pat. Falconer going for the ball. There's no question he made contact with Tommy Scott, but he certainly had a shot at the football. Alisic to punt. And this is for Zanny at his goal line right now. And he goes down at the 10. The wind must be playing little tricks out there, gentlemen, because Tommy had a tough time trying to get that ball settled He was very fortunate to get back to the 10-yard line. I thought he was going to fall back into the end zone. 39 yards, the punt by Alyssa. And there you see Forzani's act, and he did a good job to get it out to the 10. He wasn't going to get fancy here. He just found himself a hole, got down. And the Stampeders have possession with a first down at their own 10-yard line and seven minutes and 15 seconds left to play in this first half. Huffnagel <laughs> just dumps it off to Burton. And he gets five yards to the 15. Potter is there to bring him down for the Eskimos. Pat, I don't know if we can anticipate a quarterback change for the Edmonton Eskimos when they get this ball back, but Warren Moon has been warming up on the sideline. Mike has made a comment once or twice. Wilkie has not been particularly sharp so far in this ballgame. The gain was five yards on the swing pass from Huffnagel to Willie Burton, so it's second and five, Stampeders, from their 15. Burton is 10, Sykes 11. Bagel delivers for Armstead. He makes the catch, has the first down out to the 25 yard line. The gain is 10 yards and a very important Stampeder first down. You now, the observation has been made that the Stampeders in this drive that they've made coming into the playoffs have not been a big play team. They're a team that's just been solid and consistent offensively and defensively, and they're showing you that kind of football this afternoon. A big play there by Huffnagel to get from his deep in his own end. They've won six in a row and nine of their last ten, the hottest team in the CFL. Huffnagel dumps it off to Sykes, what a one-handed catch. And he's leveled, but has another first down, out to the 40, and now a flag comes down. Mike, you mentioned before the ball game one of the key ingredients you felt for the Edmonton Eskimos. One advantage they had was in the linebacking core. This is Dan Kepley, the man you talked about making the hit. Looks like a clip on that play, too. I'll tell you, if it is against the Stan Peters, a tough break because that was just an outstanding performance by John Huffnagel to get away from that rush and get the ball off. We'll take another look at it right now. The Eskimos haven't been on them that much this afternoon, but they were there very alertly getting it off to Sykes. And, of course, you know how dangerous he is. He had picked up 15 before Kepley just leveled him, but now they're taking it all the way back. And Coming, running second. Number 14, Calgary, before yards were gained. Kelvin Kirk appears to be the culprit. Pretty good job of hanging on to the football, Mike, too, when you're hit like that. Kepley really leveled it. Good job holding on to his head. It was a clipping call, and it puts the ball inside the Stampeder 15 instead of being out at the 40. So when you look at it that way, it's really a 27-yard penalty because the game is negated and the penalty is tacked on. It's a Sykes, and he's nailed virtually at the line of scrimmage. Well, you put the name to him, Pat, early in the ball game. Dr. Death, Dave Fennell, number 65. Watch him stop it up here. He's working against Titley, the offensive center of the Calgary Stampeders, and just handles him extremely easily. Stampeders really faced with a tough spot now. It's second down at about 27 yards. Those Ron Estes sometimes coming from an upright position, in effect giving a, a look at a 3-4 defensive front. Second and 25, Stan Peters. Up Nagel delivers, no good. I don't know if Vickers was going to come across or whatever happened, but there was no receiver in the area. Mike, you also mentioned Este was taking the inside route from time to time. He does it again here, number 55, and he's the one that put the pressure on quarterback John Huffnagel. Working against Humphreys, 51, the left offensive tackle on that side. He got good penetration. Both clubs have managed only one first down in this second quarter. 
as Cyril McFall stands in his end zone to punt on third and 25. He gets it away, and it's a good boot. Holloman is back to his 50 and then drops the ball. There'll be no return on it, but it could have been disastrous because Holloman really had his problems. It was a 52-yard clutch kick by Cyril McFall. Well, got his remaining the quarterback, uh, Pat, excuse me. The moon had been warming up beforehand, but Coach Hugh Campbell has decided to go with his outstanding player in the country candidate from Western Canada, Tom Wilkinson, a quarterback. The Eskimos have it just outside their 50-yard line with four minutes left to play in the half. Wilkinson throws the diving catch is made. Brian Fryer, I think the fellow we mentioned if he bring in on passing situation, Pat, that's the first time they've gone to Fryer. It appeared to me as if Brian Fryer had given just a little outside move and then broke it upfield. He does a tremendous job picking up 23 yards. Tom Wilkinson with that little roll to the right, getting all the time he needed to allow Fryer the opportunity to get open, and he did, and the Eskimos are threatening again. There's another look. You saw the little move to the outside and turning it up. First down, Eskimos at the Calgary 37. The draw goes to German, to Warrington, and Warrington gets inside the 35 to about the 34. He'll have a couple. You know, Wilkie might not have been really sharp up to this point in time, but when you've had as much success as he's had over these many years, you don't remove experience too quickly. You have to leave him in for a while. Well, that's an interesting statistic as we give you the most important one. The score, 10 to 3 in favor of the Stampeders. And the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. We're down to the final three minutes of this first half. The Calgary Stampeders on the Ray Odoms interception that he returned for a touchdown, lead it 10 to 3. Now it is second and seven Eskimos from the Calgary 33 yard line, and Wilkinson puts it up. The catch is made by Tommy Scott inside the five yard line. I tell you, they got man-to-man -man coverage here because you'll see the linebackers coming. Ollie Bakken, Bob Howells, the offensive center, does a great job of picking him up. But Scott uses his big speed to great advantage here, and he's wide open. But Wilkie delivers the ball right on target. 29 yards. Tom Scott with the speed. Got a beat, and Wilkinson got it there. Wilkinson threw the ball into the end zone. There was nobody there. I don't think that Scott could get to the area. Second and touchdown to go. Eskimos just inside the Calgary five-yard line. The Stampeder Club playing with a tremendous amount of poise considering it's their first final since 71. You look at Tom Wilkinson's statistics. You know there's only one Stampeder that was on that 71 team, and that's John Helton. What a job by Joe Tiller and Jock Cota to have this club here. Flag comes down. The pass was intended in the end zone for Stu Lang. Knocked down by the middle linebacker, Ali Bakken. I think McElhenney uh, jumped offside the left defensive end, and that's really going to cost the Stamp Peters. They had the Edmonton Eskimos stop. You see McElhenney number 64 right here, and I think he moved before the ball is snapped. Ready to be the call, I'm sure. The Eskimos will be given another chance as Angelo Santucci comes in the ball game with a message from Hugh Campbell. It's the kind of club you don't want to give extra chances to because they can do so many things to you. Don Warrington comes out of the ball game. Angelo Santucci is in. And you talk about big breaks. It sure is. It's an automatic first down. First and touchdown to go from the two and a half yard line. 
Well, you see that the Eskimos scored an awful lot of points this year. They need a major score here. They get back in this ball game. Santucci in Germany in the eye behind Tom Wilkinson. They give us to Germany. Touchdown. Commonwealth Stadium explodes, and why not? A brilliant march engineered by Tom Wilkinson. Look at the blocking in the right side of that line. That must make you feel good, Frank, to see that kind of efficiency in your offensive line. Germany's done it ten times this season. He does it again, and they made it look very easy. Ken Tucci did a good job coming from that fullback spot as well, knocking Coach Shell to the outside. But Tisha, you're absolutely right, Mike. A wide open hole. Dave Cutler can tie it all up at ten. And he does. With two minutes and 29 seconds left to play in this half. You see Santucci, number 23, leading Germany in there. Michelle comes up from the outside. Just Germany just turns it up. And Blaine Lamoureux was the only one that had a chance to stop Germany. But he was well into the end zone before any contact was made. A very critical offside penalty allowed the Eskimos to keep the ball inside the five. Pat, you talk about critical penalties. I think the one that really hurt the Stampeders was that clipping call on Kelvin Kirk after the great reception Jim Sykes made. They would have had a first down, as Mike mentioned, out to about the 27 or 30 yard line. All of a sudden, they turned it around completely and wound up faced with a, a second and 27 situation. And Stamp I mean, the uh, Eskimos got good field position. I'd agree with you all entirely. I think that's exactly where it turned around against the Stampeders and for the Eskimos. Cutler's kickoff is grabbed by Armstead at about the 27. He gets out over the 40 to about the 41 yard line. So with two minutes and 23 seconds left to play in the half, that 14 yard return by Armstead gives John Huffnagel some half decent field position outside the Calgary 40. We are all tied at 10. A tough hitting football game, very well played. And the suggestion was made early that it will probably come down to the final few minutes, and it certainly appears that way now. Huff Bagel down at about the 53-yard line, and he has the first down. Not a bad move by Huffnagel as he approached the line of scrimmage. He had James Sykes off to the left side, gave the little fake. Tom Towns went with it and opened it up for him to pick up that first down. Not a great scrambler, but he's picked up 29 yards this afternoon. The leading rusher in the ball game. Yeah, he's right taken end. off three separate times, almost uh, out of desperation, but he's picking up first down or close to it almost every time. The ball is at the Calgary 53, first down, Stampeders. This is Sykes. Sykes is met on the corner as he tried to turn it upfield by Ed Jones. Dale Potter was there from his outside linebacking position as well. The gain will be about a yard, make it second and nine for the Cowboys right at midfield. Well, the Stampeders with Burton and Sykes carrying the load led the CFL in rushing this season. 2,159 yards. A thousand plus went to Sykes. Huffnagel just dropped it off, and certainly it's a very alert play on his part because Sykes was there, but really what Huffnagel was trying to do was save his own skin and save the loss of some yardage. Well, you saw Dan Kepley coming from his linebacking spot. He actually blitzed to the left side, but it, he was the reason that Huffnagel couldn't pull up because Kepley was chasing him from the backside, and he just had no time at all to try and find a receiver. You see, try to dump it off to Sykes. Incomplete. It'll be a third down and eight situation. Just a minute and 13 remaining in this tied ball game. In the first half, I should say. Well, it's third and nine, and McFall is punting. And again, another good boot. Holloman is back to his five. Good return by Holloman out over the 15 to about the 18 yard line. The downfield tackle was made by Robin Harper for the Calgary Stampeders. A 50 yard boot by McFall and a 12 yard return by Joe Holloman with one minute left to play in this first half and it's all tied at 10. 
I expect that uh, Wilkie would be a little conservative. Oh, yeah. Being at about his own 16 or 17 yard line pad, I wouldn't think he's going to try anything too fancy. It's Warrington and Germany as the two setbacks. There is to Warrington. And he gets about three or four tough ones. Talk is stopped momentarily at 57 seconds. We've talked an awful lot about Dan Kepley. Ali Bakken has done an outstanding job for the Calgary Stampeders. And you know, Frank, so many times this afternoon, we talked about the pass rush that they get from their front four. You can't get that kind of pass rush unless you're backed up by good people. And their linebacking core has given them that kind of support. I agree with you, Mike. I think the only advantage Kepley has maybe is the range that we talked about before. Bakken certainly does a good job against the run. He's just not quite as quick as Dan Kepley. This is Germany, and Germany gets to the 25. He'll be short of the first down by about a yard. Placement of the ball will be important, but they lay it right down at the 25-yard line with 30 seconds showing on the clock. It is stopped momentarily. Wilkinson leaves the field, and the punting unit comes out. Well, at halftime, we will introduce you to the countdown all-pro selections. The three of us were there when we taped that show. Boy, there were some great performances by these outstanding players in the CFL. They're all going to be in Toronto next week for the Great Cup game, and we'll be there as well. We'll be looking forward to that one. Whoever represents the West or the East, you know the Great Cup's going to be a great one, Frank. And we will have it all for you right here on CTV. We'll be there two hours before Great Cup with an outstanding array of programs for you, so we hope you'll tune us in. This is Forzani at his 47-yard line, and he runs out of bounds right at the point where he made the catch with just two seconds showing on the clock. A 38-yard boot by Hank Olisic, and the Stampeders will have one final play. Jack Gotta has just so fired up. I saw him about an hour and a half before the game out here in the field. I think he was ready to play himself. He walks about three feet off the ground. Anybody? <laughs> I'll tell you. You know, there's so different personalities, though. Huey Campbell is quiet, but he has a great sense of humor. Jack, as you mentioned, is so bubbly, up and down all the time. They were both very hyper, though, for this game, and understandably. Final play of the half. Barring a penalty. And Hoffnagel's going to go upstairs. He thought he was. The ball came loose. It is picked up for the Stampeders by Lloyd Fairbanks. <laughs> he laterals it off. Now, they call that an offside pass. It was very close. Throw it back to Huffnagel, Tommy. <laughs> Borzani is dropped at the 43-yard line, and I'm sure they'll rule that Fairbanks threw the ball forward to Borzani. He threw that one on the turf, uh, bad <laughs> in the huddle. You know, actually, quite a dangerous play when you think about it. Oh, it sure was, particularly when Tommy was running around back there. There's Lloyd Fairbanks trying to make something out of it. I think Huffnagel himself was in a dangerous position trying to hold on to the ball for the big play. Well, it was an offside pass from Fairbanks to Forzani. The penalty is declined. The gun sounds to end the first half of play. Edmonton 10, Calgary 10. This is the CFL on CTV, and we'll be back in just a moment. Can't be any closer, tied at 10. And look at those plays from scrimmage over the year. Just one play separating the two clubs. And in this game, they are tied at 26 plays apiece. So I think we should mention right here that we've got at least 30 minutes of football, but it could go beyond that because then we go to overtime if they're still tied. And the overtime format is quite simple. Two 10-minute halves. There is never sudden death. They will continue playing 20-minute ball games. In effect, that's what it is until somebody breaks the tie if, in fact, we ever get to that stage. It could, could be a couple of deaths. Bill Stevenson and Al McCann <laughs> on the sideline. <laughs> well, obviously, the choice was Edmonton's, and they have elected to kick off. Kirk, 14, and Sykes, 11, are back at the 10-yard line. Cutler is set, and the second half is underway. Sykes is at his 8-yard line.
slowed down initially by Ed Jones as he crossed the 20-yard line to about the 22. It was a 57-yard kickoff, a 20-yard return. As you look at the first half statistics, and you can see that the Russian game was very close, 48-43, to 43, and the Eskimos with that final drive jumped out a little bit in front, 185 to 131 in total yards. Tough day for passing because, of course, people can't get good traction, but nevertheless, they have moved the ball a little bit, and we expect more of it in this half. This is Sykes, and Sykes gets out over the 35 to about the 36, and he'll have a gain of very close to eight yards. Doing something the Stampeders were not able to establish in the first half of play, the running game. Sykes, of course, accomplished so much over the season. 1,020 yards rushing, 50 pass receptions. Boy, what a year, whether it's your rookie year or not. It's just a tremendous effort. As a matter of fact, Sykes gained about nine, so it is second and one. They give us the Sykes again, second man through. And he has the first down to the 40-yard line. Pat, we've got Al Wilson uh, back up in the booth with us here, the all-pro center, of course, in the BC Lions. And Al, it seemed in the last part of the first half that the Edmonton Eskimos, the momentum was going their way. Did you, did you feel that way? Yeah, I felt their class was starting to show. They started to get control of the football. They started to do the things that they do well. They were aided by a couple of penalties, though, to keep that drive, to put that touchdown in. Well, you see Willie Burton going in there, picking up three or four yards again, and the Stampeders obviously coming out to run this football in the second half. Do you think they can do that successfully against this big front four? The best way to do it is to get your offensive linemen to take wide splits so you don't have to actually move the defensive linemen, but shield them and let the back pick his hole. Okay, I'll, we'll look for it. Thank you, gentlemen. The gain was about three yards, so make it second and seven for the Stampeders. The ball is just outside their 43-yard line. It's all tied at 10. We have just begun play here in quarter number three. Huffnagel swings it out to Sykes. And Sykes, with good effort, appears to have the first down crossing the 50 to the 51-yard line. Boy, he took that ball and just hit it upfield. Tom Towns wanted to move in on him. It appeared as if he might have had him lined up short of the first down. But Sykes just had a burst of speed, got by the initial tackler right there. Got more than enough. Ball is just outside the Calgary 50-yard line. First down, Stampeders. Hoffnagel <laughs> looking for Porzani, and he overthrows it. So it'll be second and ten for the Stampeders. They took the opening second-half second kickoff and have gone back-to-back -back first downs to get the ball to where it lies right now. And, of course, every series becomes so critical now, becomes so critical now, as you take a look at one of the 1979 Grand Prix that will be awarded to the outstanding offensive and outstanding defensive players in next week's Grey Cup game, compliments of Labatt's. Is down inside the 45-yard line. Well, they just came with everybody that time. We haven't seen the Eskimos come with a blitzing situation too often, but you see Dan Kepley as well as the outside linebackers, Tom Towns, both come on this play. Actually, Towns didn't come in. It was Potter on the backside that did, but Kepley blitzed up the middle, number 42. I believe that's the first time that they've sacked quarterback John Huffnagel of the Stampeders in this ballgame, Pat. I think you're right. The kick by McFall takes a Calgary bounce. Holloman chasing it down at his 15-yard line, finally picks it up. And gets out over the 20 to about the 23. And that's where the Eskimos will start with 11 minutes and 34 seconds left to play in this third quarter. A 52-yard boot by McFall, about 25 of those yards coming on the roll. A nine-yard return by Holloman as Tom Wilkinson and the Eskimo offense comes out onto the field for the first time in this half. We're here from all over today. We saw some Alouette fans. Of course, they'll play Ottawa tomorrow. They're here from Cape Breton. They're here from all over to see two great football teams go at it in the Western Conference Final. 
Give us the Germany. That's the hole. Has the first down over the 35 to about the 39-yard line. The gain is 15 yards for Jim Germany, and it gives him a total of 51 on the afternoon on 10 carries. Just a big hole over that left side. A great job by Eric Upton and Willie Martin initially. Germany's able to pick up a few more blockers, get a little extra yardage. Tommy Scott's out there, George McGowan as well. They worked it beautifully. Watch, watch that block by Upton on, on Jonas in number 47. He just blows him right out of there. Reads a gigantic hole for Germany. The ball is at the Eskimo 38. Second man through again is Germany. And he's out over the 40 to about the 43, so he'll have close to five yards. Looks like both ball clubs have the same idea, Mike. They're both trying to establish the running game, which neither team did very effectively in the first half. Germany slow to get to his feet as you look at another interesting figure that the Stampeder defensive unit really came on this year and that's why they're in this Western Conference final up around the eye area apparently is the cause for concern and I'm sure we'll see Germany in just a few moments as Angelo Santucci comes out onto the field might have got a finger in the eye. Yeah, it doesn't look like he hurt badly, Pat, but that would really be a blow for the Eskimos. You know, another interesting stat that we haven't shown you is the Edmonton Eskimos all the won the first place to finish in the West. They're the only team in the West that did not have a thousand yard rusher on the ball club. Germany was their leading rusher at 885. Warrington was looking for the first down, but the Stamp Eaters read it beautifully and actually nailed him just about at the line of scrimmage. Well, it's a 10-10 ball game with 9.54 to play in the third quarter, and the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. I'm at field level with Jim Adams, the trainer of the Eskimos. Jim, uh, Jim Germany poked in the eye by a finger, I guess, eh? Yes, that's correct. Not too bad, though, eh? Not a bad. He'll be back in the next series. Isn't it ironic? A hard-hitting game in cold weather where there hasn't been a serious injury on either side. No, not in that. This is a big game. Both teams are ready for it, so you're not going to get the a lot of silly injuries. Boy, eh? Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Al McCann. We are set now with the third down punt from Hank Elisic. Not a good one. Off the side of his foot and goes out of bounds at the Calgary 40 and a half yard line. Got the best average in the CFL, but Frank, before the game started, you said one thing that could be a factor is Hank Elisic's punting. Not because he's necessarily the best punter, but because he can be erratic at times. Well, he is inconsistent. You know, he's a very young fellow. As a matter of fact, I think he's the youngest guy in the Canadian Football League. And as you see, he led the league in punting all year long, but every once in a while, he'll pull one or shank one like he did right there. That one was 36 yards by Elisic as McFall is actually out kicking him 47 yards to 41. Up Nagel unloads it just at the last moment. As the pressure really got to him. Este was in there. And so too, I believe, was your answer. Most often this afternoon, that Calgary front wall has given Huffnagel pretty good protection, but Jorg Henschel, one of the first to get in there, but then all the others came along with him. Huffnagel getting more pressure in this third quarter than we've seen. He was a bit shaken up on that play, too. He stayed in the ball game, but that would really be a blow to the Stampeders, hope. That is second and 10, Calgary, just outside their 40 yard line. Over the middle to Kirk, he's got the ball. Now, does he have the first down? He's very close to it. Lavarado wrapped him up at about the 51 yard line. And they actually spot it at the 52, so it'll be a Stampeder first down. Nothing fancy, just a little look in. Delivers it pretty well, and you know, he's still operating with that jammed thumb, and this cold weather isn't going to help those circumstances at all. Pretty gutty performance by Jim Huffnagel this afternoon, John Huffnagel this afternoon. One thing about it, that'll take the rush away from you if you get rid of the ball that quickly. Kirk has caught only two passes, but he saw the yardage, 65. Huffnagel going deep for Armstead. He was in behind the coverage, but the ball was overthrown. Joe Holliman on the coverage for the Eskimos. Big Dave Fennell really gets to John Huffnagel once again after he releases his ball. 
Yeah, coming in from the back side, Joe Holloman was the defender back there with Armstead, but the ball was overthrown by a good five yards. It'll be second and ten now for the Stampeders. We're just into the third quarter. 8-11 remaining. Those heavy hits a little harder to take, too, when you're as cold as those players will be. Ball is just outside the Calgary 51-yard line, second and ten. Up they go, swings it up, sights for the resort his head. I think they took Al Wilson's suggestion and spread that defensive line out, but they didn't do one thing. They didn't even touch Ron Estee on this play. Watch him get in on quarterback John Huffnagel completely free. I think it was Humphreys uh, on that left side there that slipped and fell. Nobody touched Ron Estee. And that means that Cyril McFall will be punting on third and ten. He stands at his own 38-yard line. Holloman and Highbar are inside the Edmonton ten. Another good punt by McFall. This is high bar at his eight yard line. Well, he did it in the first quarter and he's done it again. Takes the Eskimos out of a hole as he returns that punt 21 yards. It was a 50 yard boot by Cyril McFall. We are still tied at 10 and the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. you're watching this Western Conference final across our great country we hope you're enjoying it we know this much 43,000 people are alive here at Commonwealth Stadium they're cheering on every play and now they want to see the Eskimo offense get moving first down at their 28 yard line it is to Warrington Warrington fumbles the ball and Odoms has it inside the 25 Mike, I didn't really see who stripped that ball from him, but they certainly had a good defensive effort. Andy Jonas, at number 47, was the first defender in there. I, I think he was the one that knocked the ball loose from Warrington. Another big turnover for the Stampeders as Odom picks up yet another turnover. Well, Look, he has to make the stop. Has he been the man on the spot all this afternoon? And this Calgary defense, we've talked about it throughout. They've done a great job. Edmonton hasn't really hurt them an awful lot, and they've created another big opportunity now to take this lead over. The ball is at the Edmonton 22-yard line. The give is to Sykes. Sykes gets to the 20 and not much further. Kepley was there. And so, too, was Ed Jones. I'll tell you, normally what's happened all year long is Willie Burden has done such an excellent job in blocking for Jim Sykes, but this time he just gets stood up right at the line of scrimmage. David Boone, number 64, the defensive end, he's trying to get a piece of, but Willie did not do his job on that play. Seems to me that Ed Jones did a pretty good job of stepping in here, too. He does a tremendous job filling that hole. The game was a couple. The ball is at the 20. Second and eight, Stan Peters. Huffnagel looking for Armstead in the end zone. No go. Greg Butler knocks the ball away from Willie Armstead to prevent the touchdown. It appeared as if Armstead was open there momentarily, Frank. I thought he had a step or two on Butler, but what a great recovery. A long ball. It gave Butler the opportunity to come back, and he got his hand up. No opportunity for Armstead. I'm a little surprised they went deep on that play. I thought they'd send somebody out in the flat. It seems the area that they're having more success with is a shorter type of thing. Uh, Mike, as you mentioned, the Eskimos are putting a lot more pressure on Huffnagel, and he's not got the time to pick out a deep receiver in most cases. And Falls field goal try will come from the 27. And it is good. The Stampeders are back in the lead at 13 to 10 with five minutes and 38 seconds left to play in this third quarter. Let me tell you, a young football team capturing the lead at this stage has to mean an awful lot to them. We've got Al Wilson back with us once again, the uh, outstanding offensive center of the BC Lions. And Al, you said that the Stampeders would need two big breaks. Odoms, of course, picked off that interception and scored in the first half. Now he comes up with another fumble, resulting in three points. Is that enough for them? I don't know. Edmonton's coming on too strong. They've got, I want to see this control of the Edmonton offense now. If the defense can hold them and force them to maybe get another field goal out of it, they can win the game. I, it's not the biggest break in the world. I think a touchdown would have been the, the break that would broke it for the... Wookie seems to have tried to run the ball an awful lot in the second half. Is he going to start throwing it now? I, he doesn't have to gamble yet. He's doing all right. He keeps staying on his shorts. He's going inside. There he goes. He's going up the middle again. Okay, all thank you. 
Thanks very much, Dal Wilson, as Jim Germany gets out to the 40-yard line, and his game will be five to make it second and five for the Eskimos from that point. They elected to take the ball at the 35 rather than have the Stampeders kick off, and we have an injured Calgary player on the field right at this moment, I believe. Oh, is it Andy Jonason? I think it is the man who created that turnover that uh, Frank was just speaking to Al Wilson about. He's had a big afternoon for them. That front four, just to go over it again for you, of the Stampeders features Reggie Lewis, 60, Andy Jonason, 47, John Helton, 77, and Ed McElhenney, number 64. And they have done a good job in containing this Edmonton offense this afternoon. There's the Stampeder linebacking core led by Ollie Bakken, number 50 in the medal, with John Palazzetti and Blaine Lamoureux on the outside. The cornerbacks are Irvin and Odoms, and as Mike pointed out, Ray Odoms has come up with two big, big plays today. You know, the young team, they always are concerned about lack of experience in playoff games because when you get down and what might happen to you if you don't have the confidence that experience brings. But I think this Calgary Stampeder team being as strong as they have been coming into the game, playing Cal uh, Edmonton even and having a lead at this stage in the third quarter has to help them an awful lot. Well, One of the things, of course, it's been a big factor in this ball game, of course, has been the turnovers. Andy Jonas, when you see Don on the field, caused the big turnover just moments ago as you see him strip the ball from Don Warrington this of course resulted in Cyril McFall's field goal just a moment ago to put the Stampeders up 13 to 10 now look at that Pat they're uh, warming up the ball <laughs> well, you know it's very important Tom Wilkinson in talking with him earlier said what happens is the game wears on the balls get so cold that the pebble wears off and it's hard to grip them what they're doing is trying to avoid that problem so that you'll still see the good passing game that has been featured to this point. They attend to Jonathan on the sidelines as the Eskimos come up with a second and five at their 40 yard line. There to be some movement. A flag comes down as Germany gets the first down and is all the way out to the 50. A 10 yard run by Jim Germany for the first down. Flags did come down, though, the moment the ball was snapped, and we'll have to wait and see whether Calgary was offside or Edmonton was illegal procedure. I think it's McElhenney once again, uh, Pat, as you saw in the first half, who jumped before the ball was snapped. 64, Number 64, offside, penalties declined, first down. Well, you're right, Frank, it was McElhenney, as you heard referee Don Barker say, so it's a first down for the Eskimos. With four minutes and 38 seconds left to play in the third quarter, and the Stampeders out in front, 13 to 10. A lot of things happening on the sidelines, as you can see, and a lot happening on the field right now. As the give is to Germany, and he stood up by John Helton just as he got to the line of scrimmage. Well, they're trying to run right up that middle area where Andy Jonasson had been. Miles Gorell has replaced him. But John Helton does a tremendous job stopping it up this time, Frank. There is no running room at all. He's getting away from Bob Howes, the veteran offensive center of the Eskimos, and the gain is limited to one yard. There's four minutes remaining now in this third quarter, and Jonathan's being taken in the dressing room. The Calgary Stampeders has kind of doubtful a little return to the action. He looks in a great deal of pain. Miles Gorell is up against Eric Upton, both graduates of the University of Ottawa. Wilkinson is down inside the 45 yard line. Well, that was Gorell, a fellow that replaced uh, Andy Jonasson, and they really didn't expect a big rush from this giant. Uh, Gorell is about 6'7, 270 pounds, but he's the one that sacks quarterback Tom Wilkinson here. He gets away from Eric Upton, the left offensive guard for the Eskimos, and Wilkie has no chance to deliver the football. It'll be third and 15. Taking a little extra time as you see the quarterback sacks. A little extra time. He was trying to go deep. He had two receivers isolated and wanted to go for the home run ball. Melissic is standing inside his 30 and gets the boot away. Oh, this is a dandy. This is over their head. Kirk is at his goal area. And he gets to about the 10 yard line. But what a punt by Hank Melissic. 64 yards. 
It is Calgary 13, Edmonton 10, and the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. Well, there's normal wear, I guess, for this time of the year out here at Alberta, certainly the northern part, but he looks like he's having a good time. Now the Alberta crude, much bottom defense, has to come through for the Eskimos. The Stampeders are at the nine, and the give is to Burden. Burden gets outside and is up very close to the 20-yard line, and I believe he's reached that point, so it should be a first down. I tell you, I think a great job of running. It seemed to me the Eskimos had reacted up. Dale Potter seemed to have a shot at him. Tom Towns as well. But Willie Burton did a great job just exploding through what opening there was. And he got a big help from Jim Sykes as well, kicking the linebacker out on the outside. Watch Sykes leading Burton this time. Normally it's the other way around. It is a first down. And this is Sykes this time. He gets maybe two or three. Penetrating quickly was Tom Towns, number 20. Gain is a couple, so make it second and eight for the Stampeders with two minutes, 30 seconds left to play in the third quarter. The Stampeders lead it by a field goal, 13 to 10. They have not scored an offensive touchdown. It was a pass interception, 52 yards, returned by Ray Odoms for the major score, and then the two field goals. Give us the Sykes inside, and he does not get the first down. As a matter of fact, the ball came loose, but I believe it was whistled dead at about the 27 or 28 yard line. I'd like to take another look at that. It appeared to me that Dan Kepley made a tremendous play on it, and I don't, I'm not certain that Sykes wasn't standing up, but he lost control. Now I guess he's down. Dan Kepley, we talked about how he patrols that line of scrimmage. Helping to clog it up. Gets a hold on him right there. Tom Towns also coming in. He stopped for about three yards short. They fall punting on third and two. This is a driving punt that chases Holloman back to his 30. Again, he drops the ball. He's having a problem picking it up. And finally covers it at about the 28-yard line. And Holloman may be shaken up a little bit on that play. Ben, I think that's the third time that Holloman has mishandled a punt. Very fortunate to retain control. You can see just how slippery the turf is. It was a 50-yard boot by McFall. We're seeing some tremendous punting here this afternoon. Minus four yards on the return. So the Eskimos take over at their 28-yard line. Now with a minute and 40 seconds left as Jack Goda and that entire Calgary bench is alive. to Germany it was plugged up and then he's down at the 25 he'll lose a couple good pursuit by Ollie Bakken just a great job by Reggie Lewis number 60 the right defensive end as he comes in they're attempting to block Reggie but he just stacks everything up on the inside that was Willie Martin number 50 who had the attempted trap block on Reggie Lewis but it turns out to be a two yard loss watch Charlie Turner just get bounced right back he is trying to pull on the play and Take care of Lewis, but there was no way he's going to allow that to happen. Wilkinson has not thrown a pass in this third quarter. He's only gone to Tom Scott once all day, I believe, Pat. A very critical uh, catch for the stamp here, for the Eskimos down inside the five yard line. Wilkinson fires an underhand to Germany. Germany loses the ball. Stampeders indicate they have recovered, but not so. Edmonton retains possession. They will not have a first down as they cover the ball at about the 36. I think what's happening, we're getting late in the game. The day's getting a little colder. The hands are getting colder, and that turf a little harder. You're going to see more of this kind of thing. The ball coming free. And that's what ultimately will determine the outcome of this game, Frank. It's going to be turnovers from here on in because the Weather conditions are such that you can't help but happen. Great move by Wilkie just to get rid of the football as he was slipping going down. However, the Eskimos are going to be short of a first down. However, the Eskimos are going to be short of a first down, so they'll be punting it away once again. Just 27 seconds remaining. Let's go down to field level and Bill Stevenson. 
The story on Andy Jonasson is he's gone to the dressing room. It's a dislocated right shoulder. This has happened to him before. However, they hope they can put the shoulder back in and he'll be able to see action before the end of the game. I talked to a number of the Calgary ball players too, and they tell me, Mike, regarding the trouble with the ball, they say it's so cold they can hardly tell when they're holding on to it. They just have no feel in their hands. Okay, Pat. Thank you, Bill. Good punt by Alyssa. Kirk awaits at his 23. Bounces off the first rush. And a big return by Kelvin Kirk over the 40 to about the 41. 51 yards. The punt by Hank Alisic with a 16-yard return as the third quarter comes to an end. With the score, Calgary 13, Edmonton 10. This is the CFL on CTV. We'll have fourth quarter action in a moment. We've got 15 minutes left to play in regulation time as the Stampeders take over. The handoff is to Willie Burton, and he is snuffed out just as he gets to the line of scrimmage. As you look at the three-quarter statistics, 220 total yards for the Eskimos, 179 for Calgary. The difference is three points with the Stampeders out in front, 13 to 10. Pretty good indication of how little offense there was in that third quarter. I think less than 40 yards by the Edmonton Eskimos when you consider what they had at that time. Wolke, I think, put the ball in here only one time in that entire quarter. The jam is to Burton. And he'll get nothing. Hey, Wrapped up by Wolke. Tom Towns. Both of these ball clubs seem to be going very conservative now, Mike. They're, they're both attempting to run that football on almost every play. And I'm surprised that they are, first of all, because they haven't had a great deal of success doing it. And secondly, you're... You know, the element of fumble, and Bill that gave us the report from field level, having talked to the players, it is so cold, they have difficulty even knowing they're running with the ball. Well, the Stampeders have been uh, very fortunate and very uh, astute at not giving away the football. That's been the story of this ball game so far. The Eskimos have given it up entirely too many times. Well, they're driving punt by McFall to Holloman at his 25. He finds the seam. Drag down from behind by number seven, Robin Harper. But a big return by Joe Holloman. After that 44-yard boot by McFall, Holloman returns it 21 yards. Ball is spotted at the Eskimo 44-yard line. 13 minutes, 40 seconds left to play in regulation time. A three-point edge for the Stampeders. Let's see if Wilkinson will now put it in the air. A flag comes down. Wilkinson dives forward to about the 50. He'll have a gain of close to six yards, but there is a flag down. Pat, I think that flag is down. I think it's going to be against Stu Lang holding. Uh, no, it's not. Holding is going against the Stampeders in the defensive backfield. You see McElhenney taking the inside route, and Germany pins him to the inside, giving Wilkie a lot of room to go around to that outside, but the penalty is going against the Stampeders. We have number eight. Number eight of Calgary, defensive holding. The holding was on Rob Cochelle. I didn't see it, but I have a sneaking suspicion it might have been either against Lang or Scott, presumably an inside receiver. Well, you know that the coverage had to be pretty close because once McElhaney got sealed off by Jim Germany so effectively, Wilkinson ought to have been able to pick up a receiver had there been any there, but the holding call was the reason nobody was available. Ball is spotted on the Eskimo side of midfield at about the 54 and a half yard line. Andy Jonasson has come back from the dressing room as the Eskimos have a first down. Give us to Germany. And he gets a tough couple. Now there's another flag down. Patty, you mentioned Jonathan coming back to the Stampeder bench, but I don't think he's coming back in this ball game because he doesn't have shoulder pads and he's got that arm or shoulder injury up in a sling. A rough play penalty called against the Stampeders. They played without error, it seemed, for three quarters of play. There hadn't been hurt turnovers, a minimum of penalties, but now in this fourth quarter, 
Jeff Peters being drawn into what could be some very costly miscues. A little lack of discipline now starting to settle in. I believe it was against Blaine Lamar. Wasn't it 75? I thought I heard him say 75. The ball is just outside the Stampeder 40-yard line. First down, Edmonton. They trail by three. Give us to Germany. He tries off tackle on the right side and only gets a couple to about the 39. They spot the ball just inside the 40-yard line. Sure, it's cold, but look at the smile. She figures the Eskimos are on their way back. They trail by three with 12 minutes and 15 seconds left to play in regulation time. In fact, they're already within uh, Dave Cutler's field goal range. If they can't pick up a first down here, it would have to come from about the 46-yard line if they don't gain anything here. They just Calgary defense is going. They may just throw them for a loss. I'll tell you, don't take them lightly. Wilkinson fires for Scotty Scott. And he's jolted at the 12-yard line. The hit was made by Al Burleson, but the gain of 27 yards goes from Wilkinson to Tom Scott. What a job by Tom Scott just splitting the scene. Al Burleson's deep in his coverage, playing center field, reacts up and puts a tremendous hit on him there. Scott's able to hold on, but it was his pass pattern that just split the seams that allowed him to be wide open. Hey, the Eskimos may have been very fortunate there. Al Wilson points out to us that Charlie Turner appeared to be holding Reggie Lewis. However, it was not picked up by the officials. It's a big first down for the Eskimos. At the 12-yard line of the Stampeders. Pass is complete to Warrington, and he steps out somewhere around the 6-yard line. It's an amazing pat. We talked about Tommy Scott. They went to him only once in the first half. Now they've come back only once again in the second half. And both times, very critical reception to the outstanding slot back of the Eskimos. Well, first time it wound up in a touchdown run by Germany. We'll see if Tom Scott's able to pave the way for another one. The game was about five. Make it second and a long five as Wilkie asks for quiet. Flags are down. Wilkinson looking for Warrington. He couldn't hang on, but there are flags down. And the last time the drive was kept alive, you'll recall, by an offside penalty. Let's see what it is this time. Offside, Stan Peters. I don't know if you saw it downfield, Pat, but Al Burleson caught Brian Fryer looking the other way and absolutely dropped him in the end zone. Once again, as you say, the drive will be kept alive by another miscue, the third penalty against the Stampeders in this drive. The rules committee took away that little nod of the head that Wilkie used to have coming up to the line of scrimmage that so often drew people outside. Now they have a new wrinkle. They just all of a sudden have their tight receivers split out a little bit. That sudden movement just before the snap of the ball is something that very often draws the defensive lineman offside because they see them all of a sudden splitting three to four yards wider than their original position. This is what's causing McElhaney in particular to jump. I don't know if the chain has broken. I wouldn't be surprised if it has because it is so cold here. It's conceivable that it might have snapped. They haven't marched the five yards out yet. Since it is inside the 10, I guess the penalty will be half the distance. They started, I believe, at around the 6. That would bring it into about the 3. Steve Calgary was offside defensively. When we well, you heard the penalty call. It was offside against the Stampeders. The ball is right now at about the 3-yard line. Second down repeated with about a yard and a half to go for the first down and of course the three yards for the touchdown. Well, they go to Jim Germany almost all the time in this situation. If you're going to run the ball at all and you'd expect they would because they have two cracks at this point. 
Germany having picked up 10 touchdowns on the run coming into this game. Don Warrington had failed to score on the ground. 10 minutes, 45 seconds left to play in regulation time. It is 13 to 10. You've got to know the adrenaline is pumping through this man, Jack Goda, the head coach and general manager of the Stampeders, as the Eskimos come up with a second and a yard and a half to go for the first down. He gave us to Germany. He's in for the touchdown. Frank, it looked very much to me as a duplicate of the first touchdown run by Germany this afternoon. Power off the right side, a tremendous block once again by Santucci, this time on 75, Lane Lamoureux. Great blocking up front by Bill Stevenson and Charlie Turner, and Germany's in. Watch that lead block by Santucci, and Mike, you're absolutely right. This whole drive has reminded me of the, the one big offensive drive the Eskimos had in the first half, which was highlighted by penalties against the Calgary Stampeders, particularly right down in close on offside penalties. Now uh, Santucci leading Germany into the end zone once again, and the Edmonton Eskimos take the lead for, I believe, the first time in this ballgame, 17 to 13. With 10 minutes and 21 seconds left to play in regulation time, and the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. by Dave Cutler gives the Eskimos a four-point lead and it takes away the field goal. So the Stampeders will need the touchdown now to get back into the lead with 10 minutes and 21 seconds left in regulation time. The ball bounces in front of Sykes. He's got it at his goal line. And Sykes scrambles his way out over the 20 and a flag comes down and it appears to be against the Stampeders. Pat, let's take another look at that touchdown. This could be the key play of the afternoon. Actually, Tom Scott's reception to set it up is pretty vital, too, but Angelo Santucci's been a big factor, not carrying the ball, but with his blocking. He's done a great job paving the way for number 25, Jim Germany. And the staff beaters have been penalized once again. They've really suffered badly from the flags going on the turf in this fourth quarter. They're going to have to start out inside of their own 10-yard line. The call was clipping. So the staff beaters start at about their own nine. They could use some heroics from James Sykes right about now, I'll tell you. Up Nagel has gone all the way at quarterback. He puts it over the middle to Willie Burton. And Burton slipped a little bit and managed to get to about the 15, so he'll have a gain of about five yards. Looked like they were, were they trying to set up the middle screen or did he dump it over the line of scrimmage or what happened? Seems to me like they're just trying to affect the middle screen, Pat, but uh, great support for the linebackers, particularly Dale Potter coming in to stop it before he got started. Stan Peters only had four penalties in the first three quarters. They've had four already in this quarter. The swing pass goes to Sykes. Sykes is met. The ball comes loose. The, Stamp, the uh, Eskimos have recovered, but what do they rule? Yes, Eskimo ball. Sykes would have had the first down, but the ball came loose. Was he down? I'll tell you, this may be a bit of a late whistle. We'll take another look at it. Sykes was pretty close to first down yardage. I don't know. It was awfully close. A dastardly blow, though, for the Calgary Stampeders at this time. Losing possession of the Eskimos. You know that with Gutner in their backfield, or pardon me, in their lineup, that Tom Wilkinson is 
going to be playing for a minimum of three and won't take any unnecessary risks. Nine minutes left to play in regulation time. First down, Eskimos at the Calgary 25. It was the Germany. He bowls his way for a few into about the 21, so he'll have four. Ali Bakken again was over there to help on the stop. That's interesting to note. The Western Conference Club team finishing second has not advanced to the Grey Cup with the exception of 1968 when the Stampeders did it. The 1970 a third place team. Right. It. That was the Calgary Stampeders. The game was actually only three, so it was second and seven. Wilkinson going for Scott in the end zone. No good. Cochelle was there with them. They both went high in the air, and the bell, the ball fell to the turf. They worked against Bob Cochelle a number of times this afternoon, Frank. Tom Scott seemed to have a bit of an edge on him. The ball appeared to me to hang up a little bit. Scott had to come back and really fight for it. Almost took it away. Oh, he was open, no question about it, Mike. Although Terry Irving was coming over there from his deep halfback spot to help out Cochelle, but if he'd have thrown that ball another four or five yards, it may well have been six. Now we'll see Dave Cutler. From about 29 yards, and if he's good, it will give the Eskimos a converted touchdown lead. And he doesn't miss too many from in around here. It is good. It's a 20 to 13 ball game in favor of the Eskimos with 7:43 left in regulation time. The CFL on CTV continues in a moment. All right, you think that the players are doing all the work, the people that really deserve a lot of the credit are the Edmonton fans. How do you like it, folks? We love it, man. We love it. I tell you one thing, McGowan told me in July, let's do it. We're doing it. Is it worth it in all this cold weather? It, it certainly is worth it. And I'm an Edmonton fan, and if we can't send oh. this, we'll send the second best, but you'll see the Eskimos in Toronto. All right, thanks, folks. Huff Nagel, over the middle, the flag comes down. The pass was incomplete. Ron Este seems to be a little upset. What the reason for the flag is, I don't know. Could be that Dave Pinnell's being held right there by Tommy Humphrey. Well, once again, penalties are just absolutely destroying the staff beaters in this fourth quarter. I believe it's a holding call going against them. I think we bring this back right here due to the excellent ISO work of Fred Fleming. You'll see Dave Pinnell being held right here. Might even be a face mask call, Mike. I think you're right. I think he's going to hold him all right. And I think it's by the cage. The cage with his shoulder in any of that. There's no question that Humphrey appears to be the culprit. Calgary, that penalty is declined. Following the play we have on sportsmanlike conduct of Calgary, that penalty is applied 10 yards, second down. Well, there you heard the official. It is second down, 20 yards to go. There were two penalties, one for holding, the other for unsportsmanlike conduct. As you look at number 60, Charlie Turner of the Eskimos on the sidelines. But now, with seven minutes and 20 seconds, the Stampeders have got to move this football. Over the middle, it is picked up. Greg Butler. And Butler is in with the 36 yard line. Now another flag comes down. Pat, I think that flag may have been pulled out of the official's pocket inadvertently by Willie Arnstead. I don't know that it was really a, a, a flag thrown for any infraction, but there's a tremendous interception by Greg Butler, a diving catch. And believe me, you have to have a lot of courage to dive onto this frozen field and still be able to hold on to that football. Well, you know, the people who supposedly understand this game said that experience could well be the telltale at the end of this ball game. 
And an experienced club like the Eskimos have capitalized on every opportunity they've had. And now they have a first down at the Calgary 37. Give us to Germany. He's grabbed by Helton as he digs his way into about the 33-yard line. He'll have about four. Al, what's happening down there? I'll tell you, Pat, we've got Bedlam on the Eskimo bench. Uh, they were very concerned the way all the penalties and turnovers were going against them. But in this fourth quarter, everything's turning for them. And that uh, Butler interception just turned the bench wild. Now they're yelling, now we got him, now we got him. It's finally our turn. So it looks like it might be, too. We've got six minutes, 13 seconds left to play in regulation time. Second down, six yards to go, Eskimos. Out of Germany. And Germany is inside the 25, and he'll have another first down. Well, of course, the winner of this game will be on display at Toronto's Exhibition Stadium next Sunday in the 1978 Grey Cup game, and we'll have it all for you here on CTV. Greenwich Park, but shaken up pretty badly. I don't like to mention this, but I can remember watching his dad, Joe Upton, play with the Ottawa Rough Riders many years ago. That's Greg Jutton on the side. Calgary Stampeders bench warming up over there. I would doubt very seriously if he'd be coming into this ball game replacing John Huffnagel, unless Huffnagel has a physical problem of his own. Upton really seems to be somewhat being on his face he's been taken out of the ball game you know it may just be coincidental but Edmonton really came alive offensively with that drive when Andy Jonasson went out and you wonder how much his absence has been a factor in this fourth quarter research by the Eskimos of course he came up with that big play uh, stripping Don Warrington of the football just before he was injured but a very satisfied Hugh Campbell has two big turnovers have gone the Eskimo way now a Sykes fumble and of course that interception just moments ago by Greg Butler. So it's a first down for the Eskimos. The give us to Warrington. He was met at the line of scrimmage and dropped at that point. Bakken was over to help on the tackle. And the bottom of the pile was Big John Helton number 77. Stampeder defense by no means conceded this ball game to the Eskimos, although we're inside of five minutes now, and the Eskimos have a seven-point lead. Just talked to Eric Upton, who injured his back a moment ago, number 57 offensive guard. He says he doesn't want to miss out on the finish. He's going to be back. That is second and eight for the Eskimos at the Calgary 23. Wilkinson goes down at about the 20. So this will bring Dave Cutler onto the field. Tom Wilkinson, usually about this time of the year, he's got at least 14 injuries going for him. Getting a little reckless running up into the pocket when he felt a little pressure, but he didn't want to take any chances getting rid of that ball unless he was certain. There's a tap on the head from that giant Miles Burrell that put him to the turf. As Frank mentioned, Burrell goes at 275 pounds. And now Cutler will try the field goal from about the 29-yard line. And if he's good, it gives the Eskimos a 10-point lead with about four minutes left. It is good. I'll tell you, not really a classic kick by Dave Cutler, almost a knuckleball, but he hit it so hard that it went through there easily for a three-pointer. A 10-point lead for the Eskimos now with just 3.55 remaining. And Commissioner Jake Kadar of uh, Canadian Football League will be presenting the trophy, emblematic of the Western Conference Championship immediately after this ball game. It would appear that the Eskimos are going to move on to the Grey Cup one more time. Have to be a pretty strange turn of events for the Stampeders to be able to come back from that. They played a, a tremendous game, I feel, that defensively they played the Eskimos to a standstill for three quarters, but turnovers and a few other things, Andy Jonasson's injury, all factors in allowing the Eskimos to come to the top. Up Nagel, over the middle for Willie Burden, and it is picked off by Dan Cutley. At 
the 40-yard line, and that will do it with three minutes and 30 seconds showing on the clock. A tip ball intended for Willie Burden into the hands of Dan Kepley, and the Eskimos have it again. And Willie Burton actually slipped just as the ball was coming to him. He didn't have any balance. That was the reason why it got tipped up into the air, Pat. But Dan Kipley always on the spot, and he comes up with the interception. Here's another look at it. You'll see how Burton's feet weren't underneath him. He had slipped at that spot, wasn't able to get his hands turned around for the ball properly. Eskimos have possession. Well, the fourth quarter has been a nightmare for the Stampeders with turnovers and penalties. And now they trail by 10 as Jim Germany takes the handoff, gets inside the 35-yard line, and then he's fired to the turf by Reggie Lewis. It's a 23-13 score in favor of Edmonton, and the CFL on CTV continues in a moment. Number one looks like he could be from the moon as you look at him with that hat on. That's oh, no, Pat, that's moon. his name. <laughs> that is Warren Moon, the backup quarterback for the Eskimos, but Wilkinson has gone all the way at the pivot spot. As the Eskies come out with a second and five from the 35. is to Warrington, I believe. He loses a couple of yards, but that won't concern the Eskimos. They just want to make sure they hang on to the ball. With two minutes and 41 seconds showing on the clock. They lead it by 10. But you know, the Stampeders haven't quit. They simply refuse to fold. And as long as there's time on the clock, anything can happen in the CFL. Let's not kid ourselves. Cutler will try another field goal, this one from the 45. This one is high, and it is good. He is four for four this afternoon, and the Eskimos up their lead to 13 points with two minutes and 16 seconds showing on the clock. I think it's almost time that we can congratulate the Edmonton Eskimos, Pat, but I feel really kind of sad for the Stampeders after the tremendous year that Jack Cott has led these uh, a very young football club to, to lose a ball game with three consecutive turnovers in this fourth quarter and being penalized, I think, probably a half a dozen times in this last period. You know, Riggs, I know you want to sing your song. Do you want to sing it now? Well, let's wait to second down. I'm bigger <laughs> on second down. Up Nagel fires, no good. Hold on. Water, rather wine. That's it. I thought you were going to say, <laughs> party's over. Nah, no. I'll tell you one thing, I'd like to leave this group. You're both going to continue singing. Well, first downs in this quarter, four for the Eskimos, none for the Stampeders. A couple of turnovers, an awful lot of penalties against. And now it's do or die on this one. It's second and ten from their 35. You know they'll go on third whether they make it or not. Pass is caught for the first down to Vickers at about the 46 or 47 yard line. Al, are you there? I've got Dr. Gordon Cameron. Gordon, uh, how about Jim Germany? He looks like he's got a bad shoulder again. Well, yes, he's had a pulled muscle on the front of his right shoulder for about the past two games, and he's just re-injured a little bit. Jim feels he could go back in again, but we've decided to just keep him out for this last few minutes. I think he'll be all right, but he's pretty sore. Thank you, doctor. 
Up Nagel throws complete to Forzani, and he's knocked out of bounds at about midfield with a minute 59 on the clock. The Stampeders trail by 13 points. They need the touchdown and then the recovery of the kick and another touchdown to win it. The obvious, of course, happening. The Eskimos allowing the shorter patterns, making Calgary work for anything that they're going to get. They're certainly not going to get them the fast. Second and a couple to give us the Sykes. And he gets outside and gets the first down into about the 51 or two yard line. Ed Jones forced him out at that point. A minute 55 on the clock. Stampeders using the sidelines well, however, to kill the clock on every play. Ball is spotted right at the Edmonton 51. Eskimos 26, Stampeders 13. First down, Calgary. Nagel throws for Kirk on the sidelines. It's out of bounds. And there were a lot of folks in front of John Hopnagel when he threw that one. The pressure was really coming. Of course, the Eskimos also know that the Stampeders have to pass virtually on every down. Clock has stopped once again on the incompletion with a minute 51 showing. Boy, what a history this Eskimo team has got though over the last number of years to think that they have been in the Grey Cup five out of the last six. Up Nagel dumps it off to Willie Burden and Burden does not get the first down as he's into about the 48. As a matter of fact he only gets about three or four yards. Mike, as you said, the uh, Edmonton Eskimo defense unit are quite happy to see, give up completions like that. As a matter of fact, I don't see any reason to be throwing those backs out of the backfield type of thing. They've got to pick up some yardage and pick it up quickly. You got to go. You got to go for the big one because you have to go back, back again to the same well. Well, it's third down and seven right now. Up Nagel over the middle, and Armstead drops the ball, and that'll do it. A minute 36 on the clock. You know, it was open for him. Greg Butler had slipped. Willie Armstead was wide open on the play. We'll take another view. It was all there. If he could have eluded Lavarato, he may have gone the distance. Just a little bit behind him. And of course, on a turf like this, it's very difficult to keep your footing as you look at the turnovers. Would have been a very difficult catch for Armstead, actually. Hey, gentlemen, whether Edmonton Eskimos are going to meet Ottawa or Montreal, we won't know until tomorrow afternoon. But whatever, it's going to be two very experienced, well-balanced football teams in what should be a real classic. Give us the Santucci, and he runs right into the arms of Ed McElhinney. Clock has stopped momentarily at a minute 32. And we have an injured Eskimo. Well, that's of course the thing that the Eskimos are more concerned about than anything else at this point is getting away from this game relatively injury free. The only major injury that we've seen was Andy Jonas from the Calgary Stampeders, but that's Angelo Santucci who just had a great afternoon blocking for Jim Germany that's down on the field right now. Harold Holton played well, as did all of the Stampeders, but you have to know they just feel like the world has come to an end for them. The season has, but they certainly have nothing to be at all, at all disappointed about because they have played so well in 1978. No question about that, Pat. To consider that they had not been in the playoffs since 1971. So many new players brought in by Jack Gota and Joe Teller, as we mentioned before. Boy, they've done a tremendous job in coming this far. Clock is running with 113 showing there now. Give us to Warrington and he gets to midfield as the clock stops with 110. Well, you know, we mentioned that Jack Goda did a tremendous job with the Calgary Stampeders. Let's not forget the other guy on the other side of the field, Huey Campbell, who's been here two years and has won two consecutive Western Conference championships. Club finished first a year ago, first this year. They won the Western final last year. 
And they're on their way to winning it again this afternoon. Clock is running with 50 seconds now. As Alyssa gets this one off the side of his foot, bounces right into the hands of Calvin Kirk. And Kirk gets to about the 18. So we've got 42 seconds left in the Western Conference season. That was a 47-yard punt by Alyssa, a 10-yard return. 42 seconds left to go. The Edmonton Eskimos will be appearing in the Grey Cup game next Sunday, and you'll see it here on CTV. And Craig Johnson is into the ball game at quarterback for the Stampeders. Huffnagel went all the way. Johnson now gets into the game. He fires to Kirk, forced out by Larry Highbaugh at about the 29, short of the first down by about a yard. It's academic right now, though. 38 seconds on the clock. It was tied at 10 at halftime, and then the Stampeders actually jumped out in front 13 to 10. But the Eskimos have really turned things around in this fourth quarter. A big play to Tommy Scott. He hasn't got a lot this afternoon, but he got two very important ones. Swing it out to Sykes. Like as a matter of fact, I think Scott has only made the two receptions this afternoon. I don't recall another one by him. Uh, they've only went to him one other time that I can recall down in the end zone when the ball was tipped away. But what a contribution those two receptions have been. I'll say. Clock is stopped temporarily at 31 seconds, and now time is whistled in. First down for the Stampeders at their 33. Jutman fires the sideline pass. It is complete to Forzani for a gain of maybe four or five. 23 seconds on the clock. Well, they've obviously got to turn one of these things upfield, one of these plays, because they've only got 23 seconds to go. They need the touchdown, and they need the onside kickoff recovery. Second and five. Johnson tried to swing it out to Willie Burton. The pass is knocked down. So we've got 20 seconds left. Strangely enough, they're just using the little swings. They don't even have any deep receivers that, that would tend to open it up for them a little bit. Well, I think Mike are trying to take what's being given to him, but it's far too late right now. 26 to 13, the Edmonton Eskimos out in front with just 20 seconds left to play in the Western Conference Final. That's it. Johnson goes down, only 15 seconds showing on the clock. Ron Este putting up down for a rather unmerciful finish for the Stampeders. Peters. Edmonton Eskimos coming on so strong defensively in this fourth quarter after they took that four-point lead as a result of the touchdown by Germany following the reception by Scott. Three turnovers, three field goals by Cutler, and that gave them the present lead, and from that point, it was just too much of an uphill battle. Joey Campbell wants to make sure that Warren Moon's name will show up in this Western Conference Final, and he has put him in at quarterback with 15 seconds left to play. It's all over. <laughs> Moon takes the pass from center and goes down in one knee. This will be the final play of the 1978 Western Conference season. And what a great year it's been in the West. Funny, Huey Campbell was saying he felt at the end of the season as you look at Jack Goda dejectedly on the sidelines, Huey was saying he felt at the end of the year, the BC Lions, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, all of them could have been in this Western Conference Final and been very worthy representatives. That's it. It's all over. It's a final score of Edmonton 26, Calgary 13. The Eskimos will go to the Grey Cup next Sunday, and we'll have it all for you right here on CTV. This is the